Kennedy as he discusses Jehovah Brings Blessings. How many people do you think throughout the earth say, I want to be rich? Or they say, I want to be famous. You know, there's one scripture in the Bible that tells us how we really can be rich and famous. Let's look up this scripture together. It's found in the Proverbs in the 10th chapter, in the 22nd verse. And this shows how we can be rich and famous. So in Proverbs 10, 22, we read, The blessing of Jehovah, that is what makes rich. And he has no pain with it. Sometimes we want to be rich. The Bible says we get stabbed all over with many pains, don't we? Because that seems to be the concentration of a person in this system of things, this materialistic, nationalistic system, is to get ahead in the world, to keep up with the Joneses. They don't want to keep up with the Joneses, they want to be the Joneses. And the results are that they get uh, physical pains, don't they? Ulcers and backaches and headaches and all types of nervous tensions. But it's not true with Jehovah, because this is the blessing of Jehovah that is what makes rich. It makes a person very rich. And not only that, you become famous because there's only so few on the face of this earth who want to be rich toward Jehovah God, who really want to serve Him. But notice, this is the blessing of Jehovah. And I think about the blessings means a change. It means a new personality, doesn't it? A new moral standard, a new way of life. In fact, Jesus was even calling it the way. And it was a different way to live. And that way, believe it or not, brings great blessings to God's people and changes in their personality. I was thinking about a brother by the name of uh, Brother Henry Russell. Probably don't know him, but years past, he was NBC radio. He was in charge of all the music there. And then later he went into television to the uh, Ronald Coleman show and wrote the Halls of Ivy theme. He directed Howard Keel. Uh, you can mention Doris Day or mention any of the various uh, movie stars, whoever they may be. That was his particular job. And uh, one day, uh, someone started talking to him about Jehovah. They talked about him, about Jehovah, in the morning. And that night, he had his first study. And he was at NBC Radio in Hollywood. And he was walking down the hall. And there was another man by the name of Al Cavillan. Al Cavillan is now a brother, but uh, he was in the music field for many, many years. In fact, he produced a K Sera Sera, a very, very famous song years ago. In 1962, he put a song called uh, Alley Oop, and, uh, which was over a million seller. But as he was walking down the NBC hallway, Hank said to him, How you doing there, Al? He says, Fine. And he says, Al says to Hank, he says, what are you doing? And Hank says, uh, I'm working for Jehovah. He says, who is he with? MCA? He says, you're a Jew, Al, and you don't even know who Jehovah is? He says, no. He says, what time will you be home tonight? Oh, he says, why don't you catch me around midnight? He says, okay. So he went there at midnight, took out the Let God Be Found True book, which he'd just been studying with the day before. And he had had his own Bible study after his first Bible study. And he conducted it, and they both were baptized together. And incidentally, uh, if you have a song book, Hank Russell wrote Psalm 110. We thank you, Jehovah. That's one of his songs. And, uh, but there again, the change that came over him his whole life, like uh, they're out of the business now, but their whole life was really show business. Because they thought they'd really gain richness and fame from it. When Hank started studying and came into the truth, he changed so much that when he became the theocratic school overseer, he would go over to London Palladium to direct the orchestra for a famous singer. He would leave Thursday morning and fly to Los Angeles, conduct the school Thursday night, and fly back Thursday night after the school to London. Never missed it because that was his assignment. You see, he really had a blessing from Jehovah God, did he not? Also, I think of uh, 
Sister Teresa Graves. A remarkable change in her life. Five years ago, her really desire in life, of course, was to be rich, to be famous. Of course, we read in the uh, Awake article a complete change in her life. Of course, she was married a year ago, June, and she's uh, cut down her studies. She's down to 12 studies. She figures more than that, it's a little bit more difficult with a new husband. So she just continues her 12. But her whole life has completely changed. And I remember I was on the set of uh, Get Christy Love at Studio City, and I had an opportunity to talk to her. And it was interesting because she was at that time wondering what to do with her career because these series were starting to, starting to end. And a few days before that, she'd hurt her ankle, so she was a little bit depressed state because she was in pain at the time. And there again, more pain, you see, coming with the job. But uh, the interesting thing was about it, I told her this, and she was surprised. I said, you know, you wouldn't have this job if it wasn't for me. And she said, I don't understand. I said, well, let me explain it to you. I said, I had a show many, many years ago called Laugh, Laughs Incorporated. Had 22 people in it, and we traveled through Canada and the West Coast, all around the country with this show. And I said, we had a fellow by the name of George Slaughter, and he was the one that took care of all the wardrobe, and he drove uh, one of the cars. And I said, when I got out of show business, he took the same show that we had, that we performed, and he changed the name of it from Laughs Incorporated. He took the S off and the C off, and he called it Laugh Him. And George Slaughter put Laugh Him on television, he became a multi-millionaire. And I says, that's where you got your first break. It was on a format or a show that I had written many years ago. And I wanted to explain to her what happens to you that when you start learning the truth, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief, it doesn't make any, any difference, that the pressures are there. And I gave her illustrations because I wanted her not to continue full force into the show business field, or any field that a person's in for that matter. And I explained to her how when I first started studying, all I got telephone calls from people I, that are famous to go on shows with them, to go to Hawaii, go to Alaska, and go on to Las Vegas and various places like that, in which I accepted it first because I thought it was really a blessing from Jehovah, but it wasn't really a blessing from Jehovah. Anything that keeps you from meetings and keeps you from service is not a job that Jehovah blesses. And I recall I was on a television show on the West Coast. It was called the Spade Cooley Television Show. You've never heard of it because it was only a West Coast show. But it was the number one show on the West Coast. I Love Lucy and Red Scout and Milton Berle were and followed that show. And it was in connection with another show on the East Coast, which was called The Ed Sullivan Show. And I remember every time I'd go on this show, they'd point at this one fellow and they say, See him? I say, Yes. They say, Well, he's a minister. Had a break before the show it was a live show at that time. And so I said, uh, Wally, I said, I don't understand you're a minister. He said, yes. I said, well, what, what faith? He said, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, you're a what? He said, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, Wally, I'm not being facetious. I said, but would you say that a little slower? He said, yes. He said, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, what is that, a disease? I went home that night. My wife and I have a habit of laying in bed and talking about everything that happened during the day. Well, I told her about this nutty fellow I'd met, and he gave me a little track that had flames burning on it. And all the things he told me, like I asked him, you know, if he was a minister, if he had a church. He said, no, he didn't have a church. But he said people's doorsteps was his pulpit. And that was sort of funny. You know, we laughed a little bit about that. That was sort of funny. Then he said hell was the grave. That was really funny. You know, I said Catholic, you know, you're burdened, you know. So everything he talked was so weird, so strange. We laughed, we cried. It was just fun. So I said, you know, he's such a nice, likable fellow. I know his ass inside this track, the Webster's International Dictionary, Catholic Encyclopedia, and other sources there. And I said, I'm going to check them out because I know that they're, they forged them and did something wrong with them. So we went on the Los Angeles the Library the next day. When I came home, I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, according to the Bible, and even the Catholic Encyclopedia, I said, the Bible hell is the grave. And my wife said, so what? I said, yeah, so what? Forget it. Okay. So I went back on the show again, and he asked me, he said, did you read it? Well, I said, I felt in my back of my mind, if I said I read it, he wouldn't talk to me anymore. And I wanted to talk to him some more, so I lied to him. I said, no, I didn't get a chance to. I said, but why don't you come over to the house and talk to me? So he came over at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday, and he left at 5 o'clock in the morning, 10 hours. But the thing that I was really impressed with, that no matter what I asked, he opened the Bible and gave me a Bible answer. I'm just deeply impressed with that. 
So next Wednesday he came over and he stayed again from 7 o'clock in the morning, he and his wife, till 5 o'clock in the morning. And that went on for three Wednesdays. And then I got a call from an agent to go to Hawaii. So he said, now whatever you do, go on the service every day while you're there. Because the second Saturday he had me on street work. And he invited me, he said, you want to do some street work? I said, I'd be happy to. What is it? He said, well, we'll stand on the street and we'll offer magazines on Hollywood and Vine. I said, fine. In fact, I had an agent saw me. And I waved at the agent, started walking over to him. He got this car and he drove away. And I went to his office, he never let me in again. So that was one experience I had there. And another thing about going out of the service too quickly, a man walked up to me and he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You wouldn't give your children blood. I said, wait a minute, fella. I said, my children want blood. They'll get the best blood there is. What's the matter with you? And the guy looked at me, walked down the street, and went across. And I said, Wally, this guy was talking about blood. I said, what's this bit anyway? He says, uh, let me show you scripture. So he showed me a couple of scriptures. He says, we'll talk about it tonight. I said, let me ask one thing. He says, scripture will not take blood. He says, yes. Well, that's all I needed, because I knew he proved prove it to me out of the Bible. Well, he says, by the way, here's a little card. He says, no blood transfusion. You just sign your name, put that in your wallet. I said, okay, put it in my pocket. So I went to Hawaii. I was picked up by the manager. And we were driving along. I just happened to mention to him, because Hawaii was beautiful. This is back now in 1952, many years ago. And I mentioned, uh, it's beautiful here. It's just like a paradise. I mean, wild orchids along the street and everything. And I said, you know, someday the whole earth is going to be like this. That's a Bible promise. Then that night I mentioned something else about the Bible. So next morning... Uh, he picked me up to take me down to the Kingdom Hall in Honolulu. And uh, on the way down, he stopped the car. He says, Jim, you're always talking about the Bible. And I didn't remember even saying about the Bible. He just mentioned it, you know. And he says, my daughter's up in that hospital up there. He said, when she was born, they put forceps on her. And now she, we find out she's mentally retarded. Is God punishing me for my way of life, my wicked way of life? I says, no, Pappy, we don't have a God like that. I says, the God of religion, that's a cruel God, but not our God, it's a God of love. And I said, I'll tell you what, I got a book here, and there's a chapter called Satan, the Devil. I said, I'd like to have you read that. It'll answer a lot of your questions for you. Well, I didn't know it, but he drove around to a park, and he started reading. He read about eight or nine chapters uh, that, uh, that morning. So when I came back on a field service, uh, he asked me where I'd like to go. You know, I said, well, I'd like to go back and... Uh, and uh, the next day, I'd like to have him take me to the same place again. So he said, well, what, what, are you, uh, what do you do? I said, well, no, we've been talking about the Bible. He said, yes. I said, well, it's so important. And it's so interesting, I'm going to go talk to people house to house. He said, I go with you. I said, well, certainly you can go with me. That was the month of January. And that month, he got 22 subscriptions. Uh, he talked to everybody. And one night, he says, you know, he said, uh, people are wondering why I've changed particularly the waitresses. I used to pinch them and, as they went by. And I told them I can't do that anymore because of my new religion. So they want to know what kind of religion I have that stops them from pinching them. So I said, well, uh, we'll get together. So they met in a big room upstairs. There were about 45 people that came. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and we stayed there till 6. And out of that, there was a German waitress, there was a Japanese, and there were four other couples that studied and came in the truth. Pappy continued the studies after I left Hawaii, and later he became baptized. But a complete change in his life because he was really an alcoholic, a complete alcoholic drinking all the time, and really a wild individual. And when he got the truth, he'd walk down the street, everybody knew him, and they'd say, Hey, Pappy, what's new? He'd say, New heavens and a new earth. New personality, new creation. Off he'd start and get these tracks out and books and just place it. And the boss got a little annoyed because he talked to all the customers when they came in. He ordered their table by table. He said, do you want to be happy? Here, he said, read this book. It'll make you really happy. And he's passing books out like aspirins to all these various people. But they saw the change in his particular life. So we see that Joel brings changes. And he brings blessings and changes in persons' personalities. And I had a really blessing there because I wasn't even baptized. But Joel shows you something. You can fool people. If you go out of the service over 100 hours a month and go to all the meetings, they'll believe and think you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they thought I was. And the branch overseer, Brother Keith Stebbins, asked if I wanted to give a talk. And I said, yes, because Brother Cole and Quackenbush had come back during those two weeks I'd studied and had given a talk called Only One Right Religion. And I took notes on it. I said, that's the best talk I ever heard in my whole life. What a refutation. 26, teach hellfire, 
31, immortality of the soul, 17, predestination, and so on, and eliminates all the religions, only one right religion, Jehovah's Witnesses. I, what a tremendous talk. So I took notes on it, and so I said, yes, I'd like to give a talk on religion. Well, I guess that year they had a talk on religion. They used to have it signed, you know. And so I gave the talk in the Kingdom Hall, and he came up after, and his brother Kennedy said, you were using charts. He said, I'd rather not have you use charts, he said, because I'd hold up how many, you know, of all the things, you know. And the last one was New World Society, Jehovah's Witness, you know, all charts. He said, don't use them. I said, all right. He said, I'd like to have you go to Khalid next week and give the talk. I said, fine. Well, I was there several months, and it was a blessing. I got a chance to go out every day with the missionaries. And in the afternoon, I had four or five Bible studies, and uh, I was learning, because a lot of the chapters I'd never even heard of, you know, and the missionaries were teaching these people, so it was a, a real blessing. And uh, one day, the watchtower bought came in, they come in rolls, and Keith Stebbins opened them up, and the title was called Only One Right Religion. So right away he says, Kennedy is from the society. He had felt, because of the problems there, the anointed in 1951 and 52 were saying 1954 that Armageddon was going to come. They figured 40 years from 1914, 54. And uh, so he, he wrote the society about that and asked for some information how he could uh, quiet that particular trend. And the society wrote back and said they'd, uh, uh, they'd handle the matter. So anyway, he figured I was from the society. I'm not even baptized. And because everything in the Watchtower had already quoted. He knew I had to be back at Watchtower Bethel in order to get that information. So he came out looking for me, went house to house with me, and that really thrilled me. That was a blessing to go with a branch overseer house to house. And he asked me to come to the home that night. So I went to the home that night. After the meal, he brought me back in the office. And I learned a wonderful thing, too. If you don't know anything, it's better to keep your mouth shut. That's what the Bible says. And he started asking me all these things, how to handle these problems. That's the first time I knew there were problems in God's organization. I really hadn't read the first book of Corinthians, the second Corinthians, too well, you see. And I uh, hadn't realized all these various problems. He brought all these problems up, and the only way I could answer was by going, mm-hmm, hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, he must have liked my mm-hmms, because when it was over, he invited me to go to another island over to Molokai, and he asked me if I'd like to handle the film. He said, would you like to handle the film? I said, sure. And I said, I wonder what it means to handle the film after I said it. Well, I found out all it was to take the flashlight and read. And he gave me a big lemon. I wondered why. And that was because all the bugs they have in the islands come into your nose and your mouth, and the lemon helps you swallow the bugs. That was sort of an interesting experience. Really no great blessing, but really a nice experience. But I found out another thing, too, that... There's great discouragement because, like it says, that the blessing of Jehovah, that is what makes rich, and he has no pain with it. But some discouragement comes with it, particularly when a person, uh, well, 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter is a good example of that, shows what happens when a person really wants to serve Jehovah. And this happens many, many times in the Christian congregation. I don't think it's done maliciously. But it is done. And that's First Corinthians, the 16th chapter, the ninth verse, where it says, For a large door that leads to activity has been opened to me, but there are many opposers. Well, let's say that you want to uh, auxiliary pioneer. What if you were going home now and told your next door neighbor you want an auxiliary pioneer? What would they do? Would they oppose you? No. They don't even know what it means. But you see, the opposers are in God's organization. This large door of activity. Let me illustrate it this way. A sister will say, I'm an auxiliary pioneer in June. Well, sister, you know, the kids will be out of school then, you know, and taking care of the children at home all day long, and all the children, you guys, it would be very difficult for you to go house to house with your children. And you have a husband, how are you going to get home and take care of his meals? Yeah, you know, I guess you're right. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I better put it off for a while. See, that sister became an opposer, didn't she? Instead of saying, you're going to auxiliary pioneer in uh, June? I'll tell you what, I'll pick you up every Wednesday morning and spend the day with you use my car. Ah, there's the blessings of Jehovah, isn't it? Yes, there's the difference, isn't it? I remember we left on our first assignment in 1956 to go to a little town called Lakeview, Oregon. And a brother walked up who was the congregation overseer in Glendale, California. And his brother Kennedy, he says, you know, you've been in show business. You've never worked a day in your life. And you go in a little small town of 3,000 people. 
You got two children? I'm going to tell you something right now. I figure he's going to commend me. He's remember is going to cost you just as much as anybody else for milk, butter, eggs, and gasoline. Remember that. So that's nice. Encouraging, isn't it? And it makes you think, you know, that uh, there are many opposers. Many who do not have really faith. They have little faith. And it's too bad that they try to pass that little faith on to someone else in the Christian congregation. But just like those who have faith that pass it on, a little faith is uh, contagious too, he said. So we went to Lakeview, Oregon, but the interesting thing about it was that through an experience, I got my gasoline there for 10 cents a gallon. And I got my oil free. And I got milk, butter, and eggs. That did cost me. It cost me 10 cents a dozen. 10 cents a pound. 10 cents for a gallon of milk. It was unbelievable in these farms there. So the very thing that the man was, he was worried about, I told my wife many times, I wish he'd mentioned a few more things, you know. But I remember the reason we were sent there is because the work had been stopped. They would not allow Jehovah's Witnesses to work in the city of Lakeview, but they could work in Lake County. And so the very first day, my wife and I went in to see the lawyer. And it was really funny because he thought we came in for a divorce. I think that's the idea he had when we walked in there. He was very kind. He gave us coffee. We talked and for a while, you know. Tom was a new minister in town. He was very happy. And after a while, uh, a few things I said didn't sound like a minister. So he said, well, what church? I said, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, he says, well, it's nice to have you here. I said, yes, the reason I stopped by is I have some briefs. I said, Mr. Covington has sent these, and he wanted you to read these. And so he read them. And he said, you mean that Mr. Covington would come to Lakeview, Oregon? I said, he wouldn't come here. I said, he'll go to Timbuktu. He'll go any place in the world for religious freedom. Certainly he'll come here. So he picked up the phone, and he says, Father, that was the Catholic priest in town. He says, Father, he says, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, starting today, We'll be going house to house, Father, and there's no way we can stop them. He says, no, Father, I'll talk to you later about it. And he says, Mr. Kennedy, he says, uh, you go ahead. We only had seven publishers, because most of the publishers moved out of town. There were only seven of them. But a year later, we had 47. And a year later, we had uh, around 85. In that one little town. And there was a reason for it. To show how Jehovah really brings blessings. Remember now who caused it? It was the religious ministers in the town, wasn't it? We usually don't, don't know what's happening a lot of times in our particular town. Let me explain the rich blessings here. The first Saturday we met a lady, and on Monday we made a return visit on her. And we found out after studying with her that she had been the town prostitute. She had a little place called Little Hollywood, and she had four or five girls working for her. And she made so much money that she put her husband in business and also made him one of the officials there in the city, government officials, through her money. And we tried our best to get her to come to meetings, so one day she told us that she couldn't come because it would bring shame upon Jehovah's name because she had been a former prostitute. Well, of course, my wife explained to her that uh, prostitutes would get into the kingdom before these religious leaders. But one day her Lutheran minister came over, and uh, she mentioned to him about Christmas, because she was thrilled about Christmas to find out that uh, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, and and the two accounts in the Bible, and she was thrilled with that, that uh, there was no wise men there, and there was no star there when he was born, and how religion, how confused they really are, and the simple thing of his birth. And so she brought up to her minister. And she said, do you, do you know that? He said, yes, I know that, but how do you know that? She said, well, Jehovah's Witnesses have been coming here. He says, look, he says, you just tell them to stop coming to your house. They'll really mix you up and confuse you. And she says, now, wait a minute. When you used to come to the house of prostitution, she said, you could tell me what to do. But this is my house, and you're not going to tell me what to do in my house. She said, look, you get a salary of $250 a week. We built you a house, which you stay there free. A car has been given to you. You get all kinds of little love offerings. You're always complaining about more money. And you know the witnesses do this work for free? She said, why don't you try it sometime? She said, wait a minute. She said, I've had it. She says, I'm going to start telling people the truth in this town, that my best customers are ministers, particularly the Pentecostals, because they always come. But when he heard that, it was strange how all the ministers in town had a calling. It wasn't the eagle calling, but they were leaving fast, because she was very sincere about it. And it made a wonderful thing. We knocked on the door and said, well, a new minister in town, but they had no ministers. And we had a film at that time we brought right into the churches. 
And we started inviting him to the kingdom hall, and it was just a marvelous thing. The blessing of Jehovah, that is what makes rich. I remember after another blessing, we were sent to start a congregation in a little town called Mount Shasta, California. I had an interesting experience there. There was a sister, and this sister was living with a man. And so I, another brother, went to him. We talked to her about it. And here's something that usually happens. People will say, Brother so-and-so told me that you can't come here and have relations with me. See, they don't say the Bible condemns it. They don't say that. And so she says, Brother Kennedy says, well, he went home and got a rifle. And his mother was a witness. And so she called. And she says, don't come over to Weed, California tonight. There's a book study there that I handled. And she said, don't come over. She says, because uh, Nobby has a gun and he's threatened to kill you. So I told my wife and children to stay in uh, Mont Shasta and I'd drive over there. It was like a little alley to go down. And I figured if anybody's going to shoot me, it'd be in the alley. And it's narrow and ricochet against the building. They'll get me anyway. So I went down there and I had the congregation book study and left again. And nothing happened. So I figured, well, you know. So I got home. It was a call from his mother. She said that the police had found him in the alley. And he was slumped over his rifle. So I went down to the hospital, and the doctors were debating. They didn't know was it was a brain tumor or what it was. They were talking about breaking his nose, operating through here, cutting his head. So they were so confused about the matter, didn't know what it was. They put him in a helicopter and sent him over to San Francisco. And he stayed under observation for three weeks. And they didn't know what was wrong with him. Finally, he cleared up, and they sent him back home again. Well, his sister, of course, uh, never did see this particular man again, although she had children by him. And uh, she finally married a very fine brother in the truth. I suppose still in the truth today. And this other man, I never knew what happened to him. Well, I knew that he started coming to meetings before we left there. But there again, you see, by her being obedient to the requirements, she received blessings by getting a nice, fine husband, who to this day are very, very happy. I remember in, again, another point is Leviticus 5.1 something good in the congregation to remember. You might just look at this, Leviticus 5.1. And sometimes like this, this will stop a whole congregation from flourishing or going or moving on. And this was the case of Redding, California, and also Mount Shasta, California. It says, Now in case a soul sins, that he has heard public cursing, and is a witness or he has seen it or comes to know of it, if he does not report it, then he must answer for his error. Well, there was a Bible student, and he had a young boy. When he went on this study, when his little boy got home, he said that this uh, other boy was fondling his private parts. So he told his sister about it. She said, well, don't you tell anybody about it, but I'll just keep my boys away from them. You keep your boys away from them. Now that had happened one year before we arrived in the congregation. The congregation was 100, and it stayed at 100 for about 11 years. It never changed, 100 publishers. Well, I'd always told my two sons, if anybody around you uses profanity, that's always a sign that they're not Christians, because that's how they identified Peter in the Bible. They said he swore and he cursed, and they said, oh, he can't be a Christian. So that's how they, so I said, if anybody does that, you come and tell me right away, because that's always a hint. There's going to be other things are involved in it. Or if anybody tells you a dirty story, you come and tell us right away, immediately. So he came one day and told us about this young boy told him this filthy story. So I went to the boy and I asked him, where in the world did you hear a story like that? And he said, from this young pioneer brother. And then he confessed that young pioneer brother was a homosexual. The young pioneer brother had moved up to Klamath Falls, Oregon. I called the overseer there, an overseer of another city, and we met there, met with the boy. He explained how his father, his stepfather, had abused him. And he listed all these people, the young people he affected at about 11 different congregations. There were about a dozen people disfellowshipped. That sister was corrected also. She knew about it. 
She let that corrupting influence in the congregation. And now, do we know if Jehovah's forgiven her for all the blood guilt in the congregation? So if we know something, we hear something, we don't report it. The Bible says we're just as responsible. Look at the responsibility in that woman in that congregation. And did you know a year later we still had a congregation with one exception? We started another congregation, the Anderson congregation. They had a hundred. In one year. They were out there, the friends were there, but they just Jehovah's Spirit wasn't there. So you see, the blessing of Jehovah, that is what makes rich. Adhering to Jehovah's arrangement. Another congregation we went to, again showing how Jehovah works, again showing the imperfection in God's organization. Again, showing that uh, there's solutions, though, because the blessings of Jehovah are rich. Imagine being in the congregation as the congregation overseer, the Wastar study overseer, and it's your first time there. And you come across a little part in Isaiah, and you mention that this applies to the anointed. Many people feel it applies to the other sheep. And a sister gets up and says, That's wrong, Brother Kennedy. And that was their statement as she read for about five minutes. Everybody just watched. I was a little shocked too. And I said, well, sister, I said, I think there's a scripture that will answer that for us, this particular situation. Let's, would you like to read it? And I said, I think that will give the answer. 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 11 and 12. It says, women should likewise be serious, not slanderous. Well, she read that scripture, and then I read her another scripture while she was still standing that it's disgraceful for a woman to teach in the congregation. She got up, and two other sisters behind her got up, and they walked out of the kingdom hall. So we called a judicial committee after, and I said, Brothers, I think it'd be good if we talked to these sisters, right, don't you? I said, Yes. So we called the sisters in that night. We had their three cards, and this is the line of reasoning. We didn't even mention what happened at the Watchtower. I wouldn't even brought up. But we said, sisters, we've been looking over your cards. And you three sisters are really workers in this congregation. You're hard workers. And we appreciate the hard work that you've done in the congregation. We have a new overseer now, and he really needs help and cooperation. He doesn't know anybody here. But look at this stack of cards right here. This inactive file. Big stack of cards. Now, I tell you what, could you take three of these cards that they live around you, would you go sort through there, and would you stop by and invite them to the meetings, tell them as a new overseer, and they were trying to encourage people to come back to the kingdom, well, would you do that? And all three sisters said, yes, they would. Well, now the congregation, they had already called everybody in the congregation told them they were going to have a meeting. So the effect was there. They had a meeting with the committee, but we didn't discuss what happened. Never did ever discuss about that. Those three sisters were very hard workers. You see what had happened, really, the brothers were not taking the lead. And the sisters were forced to, even in the service, meetings and everything. And that's why in less than a year's time, those three sisters are really backbones, really backbones of the congregation. Oh, we've got to call them in and cause problems for them. But the Bible says that the blessings of Jehovah, that's what makes rich, you see. And the results were, it was a very, very happy, wonderful congregation. I remember in uh, Pearl River, Louisiana, a congregation there, we were sent there, and it was an unusual congregation because uh, it was what they call split down the middle. Uh, the, uh, I think it was Brother James Hinder and Brother Barnes at that time had recommended to the society that this congregation be banned. Uh, in other words, let everybody go back to New Orleans, go to other congregations, and just... Uh, they'd already stopped their literature and their magazines for coming. In fact, uh, this is interesting. This brother got up, who was the congregation overseer, and he gave a talk in the service meeting. This was the theme of his talk. You are the synagogue of Satan. All of you are going to die. You're hateful, you're unloving, and give, give a beautiful talk. He walked out the door, got in his car, and drove to New York, and no one ever saw him again. He was a congregation overseer. That's what he thought of that congregation. So then the brothers huddled got together and said, well, well, have you been a congregation overseer? Said, oh, no. These congregation overseer, I'll leave. Well, we'll make you the car. No, no, then they'll leave. So they spent two weeks there, a district of circuit overseer, and they wrote the society to disband it. And so we got a letter when we were ready to go to that congregation. You know, you start thinking about it, the majority of all the people that were there had left New Orleans. They sold their homes, everything. They had come there really to serve the need was made, or greater. So they had come for good motives. Well, it only took one week to find out what the problem was. It was materialism. And it wasn't... Uh, I want to explain how it happened. There was a brother in the congregation, we'll call him Brother A, Brother A, built homes. 
And he built beautiful homes. He and uh, two other black men, whirly men, and they could put up houses, brick homes, and all electric and beautiful homes for half the price you could buy any place in the country. Because he wanted to do as a favor to the brothers. And the payments were even lower than they could charge for an apartment. So when the brothers came, that's what started happening. They all started buying houses, and one got two bedrooms, and one got three bedrooms, and one put a den in, and one put... And, again, and, every, and that's all they ever talked about, inviting everybody over. That's how simple and how insidious this materialistic thing became among the friends. That was a simple thing. So all we had to do is take this brother out in the service, get him active, and get him pioneering. Now he was too busy to build homes. So he said he always wanted to uh, dig wells, so he did that. And he got out of that, and that stopped the building the houses. He sold his house and got a trailer. Another brother sold his house and got a trailer. In fact, pretty soon we had eight trailers where there were eight homes. Two of those brothers were in circuit work. You know, I remember Brother George Arley. He's in circuit work today. And all of that, just a trend that started the congregation. Just by merely reversing that trend, the results were there are four families, all had children, started pioneering, and three of those families are still pioneering today. Some of the New Orleans era, some have gone to South America. So the blessings of Jehovah, that is really what makes a person really rich. Now here's a change and a blessing showing how when we come to God's organization, all of us change. But notice a drastic change here. Mobile, Alabama, had an opportunity to go on one of the ships and started talking to one of the men. And the uh, results were, well, in fact, they were all lined up. And when I got up there to the line, the fellow asked me what I wanted. I don't know if I was inspecting the ship or order, whatever the case may be. And it just happened to have him a great big King James Bible behind him. So I said, could I see that book right there? So he put it in front of me, and I had it turned to Ecclesiastes 1.4. And I said, now tell me the truth. Read the scripture and tell me if you ever heard this before in your life. So he read in the King James, one generation cometh, another goeth, but the earth abideth forever. I said, now tell me the truth. Have you ever heard the earth is always going to be here? He says, no. So I went through a new earth uh, sermon with him and placed uh, the Watchtower in the Awake, a uh, Paradise book, a Babylon book, and a few other things with him. And he his name was Norris Chansey. And he said, see that fellow over there? He said, he's a Baptist. He says, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you talk to him? His name is Pete Kakis. I said, okay. So he said, hey, Pete. I said, come here. I said, I want to show you something. Tell me the truth now. Look at this picture and tell me how many sheep are there. He says, uh, five. I said, well, try it again. I said, count again. I said, wait a minute, let's go over and use uh, his Bible. So he read Genesis 7, 2. And I said, before he read it, I said, tell me the truth. Have you ever read this before in your whole life? So he read it, where it said they brought seven of the clean and two of the unclean. He said, no, I've only heard about the unclean. I said, I actually learned in church, the dirty part. But the Bible, you learn the whole truth, you learn about the clean part. And I says, this book is all Bible. It's in Paradise Lost or Paradise Regained. I says, it has over 812 scriptures in it. Plus there's 12 chapters, complete chapters are cited. I says, this is a book for 75 cents. If you read and look up the scriptures, you really know the Bible. He says, I'll take that. Well, anyway, the ship went out, they went over to Europe, they came back, and they had read, uh, placed a New World Translation with them, they'd read all the way to Acts all the way through the Bible at that time. The second time they came back, which was about a month later, they read the complete Bible, and they were passing out. In fact, I gave, I think it was an order of 75 books of the Paradise books, and which they took on the ships and scattered them around like seeds. Well, then they came in, they said, you know, we shouldn't really be doing this kind of job because we're gone 10 months away from our families, and we deserve the Bible, we should be preaching. They came to that conclusion from studying, which is just a marvelous thing. See, Jehovah brings blessings, but they said, we're a little fearful of our job. And so I said, why don't you just write the owners of the company and just tell them what you're planning on doing. One was a captain, and the other was the first mate. And the first mate was up for captaincy, and they made real good money. And just a side point on that, too, they smuggled literature in some of the countries, because they said they could get in any country, wrote the society about it, and they did that as a side point. But anyway, they wrote to their company, and the company brought them into Houston, Texas, and gave them a desk job. Had more money, 8 to 5, Saturday and Sunday off, the evenings off. Uh, Pete is a pioneer. Uh, his wife died. She asked for a reason in the Houston area. He married another sister, been pioneering for about uh, 22 years. And they've already started two different congregations, one in Conroe, Texas, and one another location, and doing very good. Again, showing how the changes and the blessings that come in Jehovah's organization. This is where the richness comes. This is where the blessings come. Remember, I walked into the Lawrenceville congregation one time. There was a great big six-foot-six fellow there. He introduced himself, and he said, Brother Kenny, I want to thank you for helping me come in the truth. I said, I never saw you before in my life. 
He said, well, he says, I was on the state police. And he says, in Atlanta, Georgia, and he says, you were on a radio, a talk show for two hours one Sunday morning. And he says, I was on guard, governing, uh, Governor Maddox. And he said, when you started talking and uh, using the Bible, he said, the only time he said, I left and went out to help the people is when a commercial came on. And believe me, he said, we had people way out in the street that morning. And he said, when Jehovah's Witnesses came around, I invited him into the home. He said, my wife and I are both dedicated today. So this is where the rich blessings come, brothers. It comes from service, doesn't it? It comes from Jehovah God. So we're living in a time now that we should really keep that thought in mind. No pain comes with it. But we're reaching out in the world, and we're trying to increase our business, and we're trying to get more money and bigger houses, and we're like that rich man that we're so concerned about making more money that are we really going to get rich blessings from Jehovah? Oh, it's true, we may get more monetary values. Yeah, but don't be concerned. Because you see, Jesus, don't be anxious about food, clothing, and shelter. Now, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Think about it for a moment. Are we anxious about those things? Why should we be? The Bible tells us in the last days it's going to get worse. We're going to work all day long, just barely get enough to eat. It hasn't got to that point yet. The Bible foretold about the gold and the silver and the oil going to the king of the north. Years ago, the society told us about that, God's organization. Everything is happening. What did Jesus say? To become anxious when you see these things? He's rejoice. Why? Because your salvation draws near. Brothers, that's the time that we're living in. Today's watchtower says we're at the portals of a new earth. And in there it talks about our young people, like they're on a stage, and how Jehovah's watching everything they do. And our young people, today's show, lesson shows the blessings that they're receiving from Jehovah by witnessing, by talking. So brothers, wherever we are in God's organization, if we really want to be rich toward Jehovah and not have pains, then please keep kingdom interest first in our lives.